Rus or Ross were ancient people who gave their name to the lands of Russia and Belarus, White Russia. Their origin and identity are much in dispute in modern historiography. Western scholars believe that they were Scandinavian Vikings, an offshoot of the Varangians, who moved southward from the Baltic coast and founded the first consolidated state among the Eastern Slavs, centering on Kiev, modern-day Ukraine. The Viking or Normanist theory was initiated in the 18th century by German historian philologists Gottlieb Siegfried Bayer and August Ludwig von Schlötzer. These two relied on the Russian primary chronicle, an account written in the 12th century and covering the period from 852 to 1110. This theory says that the Rus, a Norman people, were first asked to come to Novgorod by the local population to put an end to their feuds. The Rus later extended their rule to Kiev, making it their keystone of defense. This theory was advanced in the 19th century by the Danish philologist Wilhelm Thomson and the German-Russian historian philologist Ernst Eduard Kunig. Russian scholars, on the other hand, have rejected the Russian primary chronicle as unreliable and have insisted that the Eastern Slavs, before the entry of the Varangians, had evolved a sophisticated feudal state comparable to the Carolingian Empire in the West. The Kievan state, they affirm, was the creation of Slavs and was attacked and held only briefly by the Norse Varangians. The Rus, Russia, live on an island in a lake. This island is three days' march across and consists of forest and thickets. It is pestilential and the soil is so damp that when a man steps on it, it quivers underfoot. They have a ruler called Kagan Rus. The Rus raid the Sakaliban Slavs, sailing in their ships until they come upon them. They take them captive and sell them in Kazaran and Bulgar. They have no cultivated fields and they live by pillaging the land of the Sakaliba. When a son is born, the father throws a naked sword before him and says, I leave you no inheritance. All you possess is what you can gain with this sword. They have no dwellings, villages or cultivated fields. They earn their living by trading in sable, grey squirrel and other furs. They sell them for silver coins which they set in belts and wear around their waists. Their clothing is always clean. The men wear gold bracelets. They treat their slaves well and dress them suitably because for them they are an article of trade. They have many cities. They are generous hosts, treating their guests well. Strangers who take refuge with them or visit them receive a warm welcome, and no one is allowed to harm them or treat them unjustly. A stranger who has a complaint or who has suffered an injustice is certain to find protectors and defenders. They use Suleiman swords. If an enemy makes war against them, they all attack together and never break ranks. They form a single fist against the enemy until they overcome them.
If one of them has a quarrel with another, it is referred to the ruler who settles it as he sees fit. If they do not agree with his settlement, he orders the difference to be settled by single combat. The man with the sharpest sword wins. The companions of the two adversaries come out and stand watching with their arms. The two men fight, and the winner imposes his will on his adversary. In their lands they have medicine men who have power comparable to the gods, for they can order the sacrifice of women, men or horses to their creator. Anything ordered by these medicine men must faithfully be executed. Any medicine man can seize a man or animal, put a rope round his neck and hang him until he dies, saying that he is a sacrifice to God. They have great stamina and endurance. They never quit the battlefield without having slaughtered their enemy. They take the women and enslave them. They are remarkable for their size, their physique and their bravery. They fight best on shipboard, not on horseback. They use up to a hundred cubits of cloth to make their trousers. The man must wrap himself in the cloth and fasten it between his knees. They never go off alone to relieve themselves, but always with three companions to guard them, sword in hand, for they have little trust in one another. Treachery is endemic, and even a poor man can be envied by a comrade, who will not hesitate to kill him and rob him. When a leading man dies, they dig a hole as big as a house, in which they bury him dressed in his clothes and wearing his gold bracelet, accompanying the corpse with food, jars of wine and coins. They bury his favorite woman with him while she is still alive, shutting her inside the tomb and there she dies.